Hmm. Um, all right, I am seeing us steady off a bit here. So I'm gonna kick us off. Um, we'll get this thing on Great. the road. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Courtney Sammons. I'm the social media and events coordinator at Grassroots Bookstore in downtown Corvallis, Oregon. And tonight we are very excited to have with us Jeff Fernside for his new book, uh, A Husband and Wife Are One Satan. And he's joined in conversation with his good friend and also local author, author Charles Goodrich. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Courtney. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you as always, Charles. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read your bios real quick and then give the audience just a quick rundown and then I will leave the floor open to you guys. So um, Jeff Rinside is the author of Making Love While Levitating Three Feet in the Air, winner of an Islands International Book Award, and a husband and wife are one Satan, winner of Orison Chapter Prize. His work has appeared in numerous literary journals and anthologies, including the Paris Review, Los Angeles Review, Story, The Pinch, and The Sun. Fernside lives, lived in Central Asia for four years and has traveled widely among the Great Silk Road, which is very cool. Um, I want to hear more about that for sure. Um, and Charles Goodrich's new book of poems, Watering the Rhubarb, is forthcoming from Flowerstone Press in 2022. Previous books include the poetry collections, A Scripture of Crows, Going to Seed, Dispatches from the Garden, and Insects of South Corvallis, a collection of essays, The Practice of Home, and two co-edited anthologies, Forest Under Story, Creative Inquiry in an Old Growth Forest, and In the Blast Zone, Catastrophe and Renewal on Mount St. Helens. Okay, so the way that this event is going to work is that Jeff and Charles are going to have a conversation for the majority of the event, um, and then we will leave the last 10-15 minutes open for an audience Q&A. Um, for the audience Q&A, please feel free to put any questions for Jeff or Charles into the specific Q&A chat box down at the bottom. Um, we will use that to run the Q&A chat. And then you can go wild as you want in the regular chat box um, with all your praise of Jeff and Charles. And then also shortly in the regular chat, I will be putting in the link to buy A Husband and Wife Are One Satan into that regular chat so that you can buy it from our bookstore. Um, we highly encourage you to buy it from Grassroots. Not only will you be supporting Jeff as an author, but also Grassroots as a small indie bookstore that's able to bring events like this to you. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to let Jeff and Charles take it away. Yes, I second that. Buy from Grassroots. We love Grassroots. So. I think we're going to start off with Jeff reading some uh, excerpts from a couple of his short stories, right, Jeff? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll just read uh, just uh, three very brief excerpts and then um, hopefully to uh, offer a little teaser uh, about what uh, this chat book is all about. And then uh, Charles will come back and we'll, we'll have a talk. So uh, this is the chat book, uh, Husband and Wife and One Satan, uh, which won the Orison chat book prize and came out uh, just this past September. So this is brand new. And I'd like to begin with an excerpt from uh, the first story in the collection called Accomplices to a Tradition. And uh, this is told in the first person uh, in the voice of uh, a young uh, ethnic Russian uh, man who lives in Kazakhstan. I'd almost made it home to my microregion when I was flagged down. I stopped, grabbed my registration papers from the glove compartment and some money from the ashtray in case I needed to pay a bribe. But before I could get out of the car, the policeman was already standing at my door. I need a ride, he said. I'd seen him at this corner many times before. If I refused him now, he would likely make my life difficult later. So even though my wife was waiting for me, I motioned for him to get in. I was guessing he wanted to buy some vodka and then have me take him home. Go to the next street and turn right, he said from the back seat. I did, but as we were passing the store that sold liquor, he didn't say anything more. Here, I asked. Farther, I'll tell you when to stop. He asked for a cigarette and we both lit up. He was a strong looking ethnic Kazakh, though not as strong as me, about my age. I was 25 then, 
newly married. And though it was a beautiful summer evening, I wanted to get home to my wife. But we just drove along in silence, him pointing directions until we were nearly out of town. Now I began getting worried. Was he taking me somewhere out of the way so he could shake me down for a really big bribe? Then why did he stop me, just another young guy in an old Lada? I'd only just started working as a guard at one of the tourist hotels in town, and my wife and I were still living with my parents. There, he said, finally, pointing to three people standing by the last, last bus stop at the end of town where the step began. I need to pick up my friends. I stopped and they all got in, a young man with a bag and a girl holding roses joining the policeman in back, another girl sitting up front with me. They all looked like ethnic Kazakhs, the new guy also about 25, the girls about 18. Do you know the lake? The policeman asked. I nodded. Good, that's where we're going. I looked at my gas gauge. The policeman must have been looking over my shoulder because he said, you have enough. He then said something to his friends in Kazakh and they all laughed. I was beginning to wish he had just asked me for a bribe and let me go. This was going to end up costing me a lot, I figured, but I didn't know what else to do. So I just started driving and tried to enjoy myself, lighting up another cigarette. It was hot out on the step, still very beautiful. I would have enjoyed it more if I hadn't been driving but drinking a little vodka instead. The guy with the bag must have been thinking the same because after about five minutes, he pulled out a bottle. They passed it around to everyone and then offered it to me. Though I wanted some, I said that I had a long way to go. The policeman seemed to think this was funny. Good, good. You shouldn't drink while you drive. It's against the law. When talking directly to me like that, they spoke in Russian but with each other, they spoke in Kazakh. I've lived in Kazakhstan all my life, but I was never able to learn any more Kazakh than what I picked up from friends at school, mostly slang. I could actually swear pretty good whenever I needed it in a fight, but I only understood a word here, a phrase there, the conversation now going on in my car. It seems the men were close friends who'd known each other for years. The girls were too, though they'd only known the men for a short time. Something about mutual acquaintances, a family connection. There was talk of a party and swimming. Since it was Friday, I guess they were planning on spending the weekend at the lake. They all seemed comfortable with each other and they quickly finished off the bottle. By now I knew all their names. Arman was a policeman, Nurken his friend. The woman sitting between them was Taparkul. She had the long, thick ponytail that many Kazakh girls wear before getting married a dark mole on her cheek matching her dark eyes. I kept staring at her in the rear view mirror, though she never looked at me. Perizat sat up front. Both women were smartly dressed, short skirts, high heels, very modern. I could see that they had swimsuits on underneath their clothes. Brother, do you want to join us at the lake? Armand asked. No, no, I can't. My wife's waiting for me at home. Who's in charge, he cried, slapping me on the shoulder. You or your wife? In the rearview mirror, I saw Nurken smirking, but Perizat turned around and said, the man may be the head, but the woman is the neck. Everyone howled at this and Armand started arguing with her, comparing the intelligence of men and women. He thought he was winning, but while she'd probably only just finished her first year at one of the local universities, she was clearly better educated from a good family, not a village girl. She and Saparkul both seemed this way. They didn't smoke and they drank modestly, leaving most of the vodka for Arman and Nurken. The men held their alcohol well, hardly seemed drunk at all. I was actually beginning to like them, but they didn't seem the best match for these girls. I guess they were just looking for a little fun. I'm not sure exactly what the girls had been told, but whatever it was, they didn't seem to mind. Okay, that's a good place to stop there. Kind of set the scene for what follows next. Um, I'm gonna cut away from the chat book for just a brief few minutes. Uh, go to my first uh, full length short story collection um, that Courtney mentioned, Making Level Levitating Three Feet in the Air. Um, 
which is also at grassroots, by the way, and you may purchase it there, and I hope you do. Um, I want to read a flash piece, a very, very short uh, piece of fiction um, that has a connection to um, the Soviet Union. Uh, the story is not set in the Soviet Union. This story is from the American point of view, but the, the Soviet Union, the shadow of the Soviet Union in the Cold War um, sort of hangs over the, the entire story. And um, I thought it made a, a, a nice counterpoint uh, to the stories um, set uh, in Kazakhstan. And this one is called Nuclear Tough Skins. My dad built a bomb shelter in our backyard the year I was born between the Berlin Wall and the Cuban Missile Crisis. But it soon became a neglected cave of concrete and canned peaches over which my best friend Johnny Lynn and I ran barefoot in ice cream sticky on hot summer days or stalked fireflies at night or threw our heads back and stalked stars. My dad standing over us, tracing the flight of what we couldn't see saying, they're up there, boys, looking down on us as we speak. That's why it's a race to the moon. Everything's a race. Then muttering godless heathens, he'd light a Salem and suddenly say, wave high to them. And we'd all wave except Johnny Lynn, who'd give the Reds the bird, though you couldn't tell he was so tan and his gesture just part of the night. My arms were tan too, but my legs were as pale as the powdered milk my mom would sneak from our cave when we ran out of hole, because no one in our family wore shorts. It wasn't allowed. Something in the Bible supported this. Sodom and Gomorrah, I was led to believe. But Johnny Lynn went to the same church as we did, and he was as dark as an Indian from the thighs down, and my parents never said he was going to hell, though I knew he swore and gave the Reds the bird and old Mr. Franklin too at the five and dime, not because I ever saw it, but because my friends said so. I wanted Indian thighs and grass-stained knees, but was afraid I'd be turned into a pillar of salt or destroyed by fire. Not even Armstrong's one small step could change my fear. It took the three channels on our TV, Mark Spitz and his seven golds, the forbidden rock on my transistor radio, and Skylab, which I imagined was manned by Major Tom. And by the time I was summer, uh, by the summer I was 12, I couldn't wait to take my protein pills and put my helmet on. So one day I cut up a brand new pair of Tough Skins jeans. It wasn't easy because new was when they were best, like Dacron armor. But I figured if you could make a trampoline out of them, then they would make good shorts. The only thing is I couldn't cut them with my new uh, school scissors or even my scout knife. I had to sneak my mom's sewing scissors out of her basket, and I still had a hard time, especially with the reinforced knees. But when I was finished, they were even cooler than Johnny Lynn's. And for one glorious afternoon, I ran with the freedom of one who lived free, who felt the heat of sunburned shin bones, yet also impossible light and air rustling through downy hair like a breeze through curtains before a thunderstorm, ran as an equal with my friend. We danced and taunted the sky where we knew Salyut lay hidden, godless, behind clouds. Look, Reds, look at us, see how we live in America, until my mom heard and chased Johnny Lynn away before scolding me inside and stripping me to my briefs, fretting about what to do with my sin. She didn't tell me to wait until my father got home like she usually did, but instead scolded and fretted, and then finally made me dig a hole in the garden where she deposited my new tough skin shorts like they were a full diaper, covered them up and said not to tell my father unless I wanted a red bottom. They're buried there still, I guarantee it, have outlasted Vietnam, the Olympic boycott, the Cold War, Star Wars. They were probably just getting broken in when the Berlin Wall fell. Someday somebody will dig them up long after we finished, finished the arms race and visited Mars. Long after Perestroika, the second coming, the 2000 year reign of the Prince of Peace, my mom says, still says is right around the corner. So we'll come back to the chat book. And I'd like to read just a very brief excerpt from the title story, A Husband and Wife for One Satan. So 
husband and wife one state. And this is a direct translation of a, of a very common phrase in Russian. Mush i jana adna satana. Husband and wife are one Satan. Now, what uh, the, that means exactly, I, I, I'm going to hold back because I, I want you to read the story and, and find out. But um, that phrase and other very colorful phrases in, in Russian is what prompted me to write this story. Um, the Russian language is so rich and um, the idioms are, are so interesting and unusual. Um, not like the cliches that we're used to, uh, more used to in English. And um, I think you'll get a sense of some of those, those phrases coming through here in this opening section that I'll read. Uh, Call a husband and wife or one Satan. Neither of them could remember exactly when their arguments began bringing more business to their cafe. A certain amount of public obnoxiousness could be expected in Kazakhstan, especially when vodka was involved, but normally the deeply personal affairs of a husband and wife were kept secret behind the locked doors of crumbling Soviet era apartments or closed gates of tiny village homes. That doesn't mean people were above prying into their neighbors' lives, especially in the villages. Raim and Raylia made it easy for them. It started out playfully. Mayor Raim would say, smacking his wife on her great round behind, which shivered like a horse's flank under her cotton skirt. Stallion, she would return, grabbing him by his fleshy hips and then pushing him away, laughing. The few customers who came at first, mostly their friends and relatives, enjoyed this little theater. Then one day, Raim returned drunk from a trip to the bazaar to buy onions, and Raelia soundly scolded him for coming in on his eyebrows in front of the entire cafe. You're really under her heel, roared the big foundry boss, Olya, and everybody laughed. Raim, normally good-natured and too drunk to fight back anyway, grinned sheepishly. But it's a very pretty heel, he said, trying to wink, but blinking both eyes instead. Once the taboo was broken, they began arguing as freely in their cafe as they did at home. Being ethnic Tatars, descendants of the Mongols who had ravaged the region some 800 years before, they already enjoyed a certain reputation for wildness. At some point, they realized that business had become brisk. Just how much was due to their tasty homestyle cooking and how much to the entertainment was uncertain. But Raelia shrewdly observed that there were certain phrases that always pleased her diners, who even insisted that the thunderous pop music, normally a cafe's main attraction, be turned down in order to hear what the combatants were saying. It was a summer Friday night, and the regulars were all there, married, bear-like Kolya and his doll-like girlfriend, Larissa, Murat, a quiet little Kazakh man, and Tikhan, the equally quiet Russian youth who always sat with him, Dilya and Olya, excitable and extravagant teenage friends, and Ali Khan, a widower everyone assumed was alcoholic because he strangely sat by himself and never spoke except to order. Raim bustled between his rolls of greeting customers, grilling large skewers of meat and dishing out portions from a massive cauldron of plov, long boiled rice, carrots and onions topped with mutton. Assalamu alaikum, he grated Murat as he did all his fellow Muslims. Peace be with you. Wa alaikum assalam, Murat ret returned. They gripped hands lightly but warmly, their free hands holding each other's forearms to show respect. Since Kolya was Christian, Raim greeted him in Russian and shook his hand in the vigorous Western style. In such a way, Raim visited each table to ensure that his customers were happy. They all settled into their seats while Raelia topped off everyone's glasses with their drinks of choice. Then the show began. Your portions are too big, Raelia complained, emphasizing each word by pointing a spoon nearly as large as a ladle at her husband. As a schoolgirl in Soviet times, she had often starred in many holiday pageants, the authority stage, and she relished reliving the emotions of those days. People come here because they're hungry, Raim said. I feed them. They'll have to feed us soon if you keep giving everything away we own. It might do you good to relax and open up a little, you dried up old galosh. 
I gave you the best years of my life. If I'm dried up, it's because you sucked me dry. Stop your talking, snake. Bloodsucker. Stubborn you. Death farter. Her eyes twinkled, for she often used this epithet with him, affectionately with him. You're lucky I married you, you from a family of cattle thieves. I'm a head taller than you. Kolya began laughing so hard, tears streamed down his ruddy cheeks. That's exactly what my wife says, he exclaimed between sobs before downing a shot of vodka. His girlfriend patted him consolingly on the arm. He placed his enormous free hand upon hers and half her slender forearm disappeared. So that's the first section. Um, I hope you check out the rest. I see Charles is back. Hey, Charles. That's great. Wonderful stuff, Jeff. Ah, well, Got thank you. Got to find out what happens. <laughs> well, I know you've read it, but uh, yeah. Several times with more pleasure each time. Oh, well, thank you for thank, thank, saying th so. Yes, I appreciate it. Well, well what I do you bet, got for me, Charles? I, I bet people are eager to hear about your experiences in, in uh, Central Asia. Um, I, it, your bio says you lived there for four years. What, what took you there? Well, where, where... Um, the Peace Corps took me. Um, I had no intention of staying four years initially. I, I went with the idea I would stay for two, which is the, the usual uh, volunteer service of Peace Corps, but uh, I met uh, a young woman there and uh, we got married. Ah. And uh, so I, after Peace Corps uh, was done, we got married and I stayed for another two years. Uh, my lovely wife, Valentina, who is my first reader on everything and my main primary source for all things Central Asia, all things Kazakhstan. And uh, yeah, we've now been in the States together. Uh, my goodness, 15 years. Huh. It doesn't seem that long. <laughs> Have you been back? We've only been back once. Um, we're actually hoping to get back again very soon. Uh, we'd like to visit family, obviously. Um, we have uh, nieces, a niece and nephew that we'd like to see, so. Yeah, it's in the works. Well, the, the stories you read from the chat book uh, demonstrated some of the, what to, be, to us would be exotic kind of characters and uh, the way they interact with one another. What do you think are some of the things that Americans might be puzzled by if they traveled to Kazakhstan? You know, um... Well, certainly there are cultural differences and um, I, I don't want to downplay those or act like they, they don't exist. But what I would like to say is that probably what people will find if they went to Kazakhstan and, and be surprised about is not what is so different, but how much we have alike, you know, how much we have in common. Um, and that's why I wanted to read that piece, um, uh, Nuclear Tough Skins, you know, uh, about the young man who grew up during the, the Cold War, because um, that, that story is not autobiographical, but I did grow up during during the Cold War. And so I certainly remember the, uh, a lot of those things. And in my mind, in those days, I imagined the Soviet Union to be this place that was always gray. It was always snowing or dark, and the people were very oppressed. And certainly there were oppressions, we know that. Uh, the government uh, was not entirely free. Uh, the gulag system was awful. Um, it, it, I don't wanna downplay any of that. Um, but what you find when you actually visit the former Soviet Union is that the people there are not unlike us. <laughs> They're, in fact, I think the reason why the Soviet Union and America were enemies in some ways is because they are so much like us. Mm. Um, and um, the, the, they're just the most hospitable people in the world. Uh, when you visit Central Asia, uh, people literally would give you the shirt off their backs. Um, mm -hmm. if, if they'll invite you in off the street almost as a stranger and welcome you as one of the family. It doesn't take long. Um, 
for them to become very protective of you. And I felt that in Central Asia. Uh, I felt that the, the people around me were always looking out after me and uh, very much considered me part of the family. I really appreciated that. Cool. I see uh, oh, we already have one question in the chat and the Q and A, and we will get to that. Thanks, Amy. Uh, for the rest of you, use your uh, Q and A button at the bottom of your screen to uh, post any questions you want to ask Jeff. Uh, one thing that has always struck me about Russian literature uh, uh, that's that's different from uh, American literature is is that Russian insistence on uh, a quality of being that they often invoke by using the word soul. In fact, mm -hmm. I want to read the epigraph from your book by the yeah. uh, Soviet writer, uh, Andrei Platonov. Mm -hmm. we, grow, we grow out of earth, out of all its impurities and everything that exists in the earth exists in us. From our ugliness, grows of the soul of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to take that on? What are, what are they getting at with that? Yeah, the, the Russian soul, Dusha in uh, Kazakh, it's Jean. Um, yeah, there is, there's definitely, I, I think, a quality you could call the Russian soul. Um, uh, my own take, and the, and the reason why I included that uh, Platonov quote is um, uh, I think the, the Russian people uh, feel very close to the earth. I think they feel very close to nature. And you see this, you see this in their, their music, their songs, their literature. Um, this is a theme that comes up again and again and again. Um, you know, they're, they're an ancient people, they're, they're an old people and they have an old history and very strong ties to the, to not just their country, but to the earth, you know. Um, so uh, I, I think that's connected uh, to the Russian soul. Um, I, I think the Russian soul has to some degree uh, a, a dark quality to it. Uh, certainly you see that in the, the great Russian writers. Uh, uh, there's a certain amount of dark philosophy. And I'll, 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 I'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit. But what I wanna say uh, first is, is, is there's also a very dark humor that Russians have. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the British are known for their very offbeat kind of humor. You know, we Americans, we have a particular kind of humor and the Russians have a very dark, dark sense of humor. Uh, my wife, uh, Valentina, uh, she's uh, ethnically Russian and sometimes she'll make jokes that will just go completely over my head because they're just so dark. And uh, I'll, I'll begin responding very seriously to her and she'll just kind of smile and say, that's just my Russian humor. So um, I think that's part of the, the Russian soul as well. Um, I, I, I don't wanna to take too long on this, Charles, because I, I know we've got questions coming in, you've got more questions, but you know, I've talked to, to Valentina about this a little bit, the Russian soul. And um, so I know what she would say about it. And her take is that um, the Russian soul includes bonds of family family and friends. And I think that's what I felt when I visited there and lived there for four years is uh, um, that sense of how family is so important. It's central uh, to, to, to life there. It's absolutely central. Um, and because of that, you get that famous hospitality. Um, now uh, there is a, a, she mentioned a, a kind of fatalism uh, that the Russians have and um, I think the reason for that fatalism that, that, that has become part of the Russian soul and, and has become through the Soviet Union become also part of the Central Asian soul um, is just due to the fact that they've gone through such hard times, such dark times. Uh, Russia has been invaded how many times over the century again and again and again. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, we had the, the Russian Revolution, you know, right after World War One, and then the, the long Civil War, and then Stalin's purges, and, you know, the Gulag, and on and on. Uh, the people have been through so much. And um, that leads to the, the last thing that I think uh, we could call part of the Russian soul, and it's resilience. There's somehow they get through it all, these, these hard, dark times. I think a lot because of the, the dark humor, I think helps them get through it. Um, but at the end of the day, I think they're a very proud people. Um, uh, 
with with very old roots and strong ties to their to their place, and um, all of that contributes to the this dusha, the Russian soul. Dusha. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. That was great. Um, let's see here. Let's uh, pick up uh, some of these people are uh, firing away questions. Yeah, that's great. Oh, good. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read uh, this from Falana because it starts. Uh, Falana. Hello, yeah. Falana. <laughs> she writes, Jeff, wow, what gripping prose. Really enjoyed your reading. Your work reminds me of Khalad Hosani. Beautiful language and impossible to not be pulled into the settings and the story. Just wondering who your writing inspirations are. Well, first I have to say, Falana is a writer herself. I know uh, we go way back to undergraduate days together. So for uh, her to say that is high praise indeed. So thank you, Falana. Um, wow, my rush, uh, my uh, writing influence as well. A lot of them are, unsurprisingly, um, writers who write in an, another language besides English. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a huge influence on me, magical realism. Um, in fact, uh, several of the stories in my first collection and um, uh, at least one and maybe even two in this collection might be called magical realist or, or, or at least surrealist and directly influenced by Garcia Marquez. Um, Andrei Platonov uh, is a huge uh, influence on me. I didn't intentionally copy his style uh, when I was writing uh, this chat book, but I'm sure it, it, it filtered in somehow. Um, in fact, my, my mom, she gave me what I, I took as a very great compliment. She said uh, on social media, she said, these stories read very much like Russian stories. And I, I thought, wow, you know, that's really cool. I, I never intended that. I wasn't consciously doing that. But uh, something about the, the, that writing must have soaked in. Uh, and uh, I, I'm glad that the spirit of that came through. Um, gosh, I mean, I've so many other writers I could name. Um, including some unusual ones uh, uh, that, you know, going way back, uh, Ray Bradbury, for Pete's sake, was my, mm. the guy who made me want to start writing. Um, mm. I don't write science fiction, but uh, uh, his enthusiasm, his, his, his love of language that comes out so clearly in his work sparked me when I was a young man and, and has, I've held that my whole life. So yeah, just, just it's just a handful off the top of my head. I mean, Cynthia Ozick, uh, my goodness. I mean, it could go on and on and on. Yeah, but anyway. Let me let me dial it in a little bit then because uh, several people have asked uh, what uh, Soviet writers that you might uh, been influenced by or more, more explicitly maybe recommend to people who read. And in, and in mm. particular, are there any Kazakh uh, writers? That, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I know you've taught, yeah. you have taught Central Asian literature, so you must mm -hmm. be. I'll yeah, more than the rest of us on that. Well, yeah, the, yeah you know, um, well, there's certainly uh, Andrei Platonov, uh, a, a must read, a must read if you're interested in Central Asia at all. And, and his, the book uh, to read is, is called Soul. And um, uh, he's, he's a, a, a Russian, uh, not just ethnic Russian, but actually from Russia. Uh, but he did, uh, he visited the region and uh, the, twice, and those visits were relatively short, uh, a period of a few months, but something of the place must have soaked in uh, because uh, other Central Asian writers have um, stated that they feel um, Platonov's soul is one of the greatest books about Central Asia uh, that were ever written, uh, that he really captured uh, the quality of, of, of those times and, and the people and the place. So um, Platonov's soul, um, Chinggis uh, Aitmatov, uh, Kyrgyzstan's great writer. And uh, the thing that's great about um, Aitmatov's work is that uh, because he's so well known, even outside of Kyrgyzstan, um, it's easily, there are a lot of uh, translations available in English. Um, and uh, his really famous book and one I've taught is um, called The Day Lasts More Than a Hundred Years. And it's still in print, uh, Indiana uh, University Press, easy to find. Um, and he has, I, 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 off the top of my head, I want to say a good four or five other books uh, in English translation that, that should be available. So um, Aitmatov, um, the Latinized uh, transliteration of that would be A-I-T, 
um, M-A-T-O-V, Aitmatov. Um, um, ah, Amid uh, Ismailov, um, the Uzbek writer. Uh, he uh, had a, a novel that came out, of, well, it's, to me, it seems like a few years ago. It was probably 15 years ago, but it was called The Railway. Um, and he has also has a number of translation books in English translation available. Um, I do want to give a warning about Ismailov's writing. Um, yeah, he's super body. <laughs> so if you have a sensitivity to bodiness, uh, he might not be your writer. But uh, if you're open to that, it, it's wild stuff. Um, the railway, uh, I, I like to, to, to call it like uh, an Uz Uzbek um, Canterbury Tales. Uh, I think he has more than 100 named characters that weave in and out of it. Stories moving in and out like a like a uh, like a Central Asian carpet. You know, the strands of a carpet coming together to form this uh, amazing picture of life there. So, um, you know, there are a lot of others. Um, the, the only problem is um, they're not readily available in the English translations. But um, I'm thinking. You know, obviously, because I've taught this, I have a, a list um, uh, of, of writers and uh, websites and, you know, books in translation, books not in translation. Um, I, here's an inducement to tell you, all, why don't we do this? Um, I will some at some point in chat, I will put in my um, Facebook um, handle and my Twitter handle. And I'll just throw out this offer. If you... Um, follow me on Twitter or, you know, j become a friend of mine on Facebook, uh, you'll be able to see my posts. I'll post this on social media, cool. uh, my, the, the list I have and um, uh, provide some links and, and, and send you off into some different directions that uh, will hopefully help you discover some really fascinating writers. Cool. That'd be a good, uh, a good moment to uh, let people know that you're going to be signing books in person in the store tomorrow i am yes if you are anywhere near corvallis oregon i will be in the physical grassroots store downtown on second street from 2 to 5 p.m in the afternoon uh signing copies of the chat book or if you want to pick up the my first book as well so yeah cool that'd be another chance to talk Central Asian literature with you if people show up and and uh, stop in at grassroots. I hope people will. But let's let's change the uh, the subject a little bit here because I, I am I'm pretty impressed by uh, how many genres you work in uh, and and successfully you've published short stories, essays, and poetry. And I. Pretty sure you have completed at least one novel and probably started others. Um, how, how do you know when something comes up? What do you, how do you know what to work on? What do you, what's, what are the cues that tell you, oh, this, this is going to be a poem? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, um, I don't have, I'm, I'm not a big believer in systems. Um, when it comes to writing, I'm, I'm a, a big believer in trusting one's own instincts, one's own heart, um, one's own intuition. And um, I, I really believe that the stories and the poems, the essays, the ideas for them exist somehow out there on their own. And it's my job to tune into them and, and somehow transcribe them as accurate, accurately as I can. So, um, and, and when I say that, I, I don't want to suggest that it's a mystical thing. Um, what I want to suggest is, is, is the creative process is a mystery to me and, and a good mystery. Now, mystical and mystery may have this, you know, the same root, but they're very different words, right? It's just, it's a mystery to me. Um, I, I don't know where my ideas come from and I don't really care to know. What I care to do is just tune into them and attend to them. and cultivate them and try to help them come into being what it is they seem they want to be. So um, it, it's just a matter of, you know, listening closely and, and, and tuning into that still small voice. So, um, you know, is something going to be a poem? Is it going to be an essay? Is it going to be a short story, uh, a novel idea, right? It, the piece tells me that. Uh, it, it's usually pretty clear right from the beginning when I get an idea that it, it, this is going to be a poem. 
this is going to be a story, right? Mm. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of how the ideas come to me, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, sometimes mm. I'll get the first line and I'll just write it on the page and everything proceeds from there. Sometimes I'll get the last line and I know that I need to start back, you know, back and work my way towards mm. the end. Um, sometimes it's just sketches of ideas. Sometimes it's a character name. Sometimes it's often I, I, I wake up in the middle of the night hearing very clearly certain words that I will get out of bed and I'll come into my office and I'll write them down mm -hmm. and they will become the basis of a story, a poem, an essay, almost exactly whole as I heard them in, in, you know, in my half waking state. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's that, you know, and as far as, you know, other things, I don't know how long we want to spend on it, but, uh, you know, in terms of writing by pen or writing by, um, uh, on a computer, but um, I, I kind of want to turn it to you, Charles, for a second, because, you know, you also are a multi-genre writer. You, you, you have several books of poetry. Uh, you have a book of essays. Uh, you're shopping around a novel right now. You know, how, how does it work for you? Good question. I don't have a clue. Uh, <laughs> it's the um, mystery. <laughs> but uh, you're right. You know, when when something comes to, you know, more often, if I get visited by brief uh, insights, it's, it's going to be a poem. Uh, a, a novel, uh, which I started working on when I retired, because I knew I had a lot more time to fill. Um, you can just consciously say, okay, I'm going to work on a scene today, but I don't work on poems that way. So mm -hmm. that, that's the main difference to me, whether the level of deliberateness I can bring to prose, whereas um, poetry is much more serendipitous, I think. Mm -hmm. Here's a, here's a uh, follow-up on that from, uh, from uh, Dee Dee Montgomery. Uh, she, oh, hey, Dee Dee. She's uh, halfway through the, the chat book and loves your characters, crafting. She wants to know how much is fictional and how much is based on real people that you know, and, mm -hmm. and maybe in general, how, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, 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 and almost every writer I know will tell you something like this. I mean, everything is part fiction and part truth all rolled into one. It's just, what are the percentages, right? Um, you know, for me, at most everything I write is mainly fiction, but there's all there. Most everything I write also has kernels of truth in it. Um, you know the the particular stories in this chat book. Um, uh, well, a couple of them uh, just were brief little snippets of things that my wife told me, hmm. uh, stories that uh, she had heard, and. Um, I wrote them down and I, I, I took, you know, what was essentially a sentence and I turned it into a story, right? But the root was in, in, in something that was real. Um, you know, with the, the, the husband and wife and one Satan, as I mentioned to you, the, the initial impetus was, was the, the richness of the Russian language that propelled me to enter that story. And then eventually the characters took on a life of their own. Um, you know the 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 last story, the Holy Sign Russian Orthodox Church. That was that was purely imagined, um, where I uh, uh, simply took a look at some uh, the history of the Soviet Union uh, as filtered through the life of one man. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a mix. It's a mix, but certainly there are hints of real people in here. Um, Certainly, um, my wife, uh, Valentina's uh, grandmother and grandfather pop up uh, pretty heavily in the husband and wife for one Satan, um, their, 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 their kind of interaction. Um, the story is not them and it's not about them, but little flavors of them come through. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's what we writers do, right? Uh, all the different experiences we've had, the people we've met, the things we've heard, it all sticks somehow and, you know, comes out in very odd ways. But yeah, there you go. Let's just say um, 
15% true, 85% fiction for this book, but definitely, definitely true things in it. Good. So what are you working on now? Oh, wow. Well, uh, I have a, an essay, as you know, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure, because uh, we've talked about it, uh, a, a new essay collection that has um, uh, about my time in Kazakhstan uh, uh, that covers um, uh, some environmental themes, some cultural themes. Um, we're in production right now, so that's been taking up a lot of my time. Mm. Uh, What's the and title and when's it coming out? It's called Ships in the Desert. Nice. And um, I'm actually starting to see it pop up on the web. Um, bookstores are already beginning to order it, but its official release won't be until next year. But uh, we're in the process of, of uh, moving forward and, and beginning promotions on that. And, and so that takes up a lot of my time. Um, because of that, uh, you know, mainly been working in poetry because it's just easier. Yeah. As you mentioned, you know, when you have large blocks of time, it's a lot easier to fall into a bigger project. When I have shorter blocks of time, it's, it's a lot easier to deal with poetry. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Cool. Uh, well, here's another genre that you haven't entered yet, but I'd be curious your thoughts about this. Um, you know, Robert Altman made uh, three Raymond Carver short stories into a movie, short yeah. cuts. Yeah, uh, love Altman. Which uh, would you, which director would you want to see make three of these short stories <laughs> to a movie? Yeah, and, and why? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would be great. That would have be these turned into a shortcut style movie. Um, okay, there, I guess there's two 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 ways to answer this. Um, the first is. It certainly would be really cool if a Central Asian director could mm. get, get a hold of this. Um, you know, Central Asia uh, has had some great films come out recently, Kazakhstan in particular. Um, my uh, wife and I just fairly recently watched one called Kalen. Um, Say it Tupan, again. Uh, Song of the Southern Seas. Uh, of course, Mongol, you know, wonderful epic. Um, so, yeah, a lot of really great films. but. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say that might not be the best approach because um, we have to acknowledge something. Um, yes, I, I did live in Central Asia for four years. Yes, I got married there. My wife is from there. We have family there. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm still an American. And you know, I still wrote this primarily for an English language audience. Right? So with that in mind, it would probably be better to have uh, an American director. Um, well, and, and I mean, you know, the top two that pop into my head are Wes Anderson and Jim Jarmusch. I mean, I, they're my favorites, um, contemporary directors. Uh, why, you know, their work is whimsical, it's intelligent, it's uh, uh, offbeat, um, and yet it's soulful, right? There's, there's always... There's always an undercurrent of something serious that runs underneath it all. I, I, I think that I think either one would be really perfect. So uh, Wes Anderson or Jim Jarmusch, if you're watching this, uh, contact me or my publisher, and uh, we'll work out something. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, the The title story in particular, I think, would be great on on film. I think. Yeah, I do too. I thank you for bringing that up, Charles. I, I like. Yeah. I love this idea. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're kind of winding down here, folks. Um, uh, still time to post a, a question. If you have any uh, still on your mind, um, put them in the Q&A box. You know what? We'll ask them. Why don't I hop on to uh, where where'd everyone will go? Uh, why don't I hop on to chat? Should I put my uh, social media handles in chat? Uh, it looks like Courtney already did. She, oh. put, your, she put your Twitter, Twitter handle. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, Facebook is easy, right? Just uh, there, I, there just aren't. Go find, uh, just go find him there. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And you'll recognize me. And uh, and I want to get the titles of those movies you just mentioned, because I'm uh, that would be especially interesting. Oh, to me. so. Uh, maybe yeah. I'll, tell you what, I, I'll, I'll put together a movie list, too. 
Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. I'm much appreciated. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to ask uh, one last question and then Courtney will wind it up for us. Um, okay. If, if, um, if someone wanted to translate your chat book into Russian or into Kazakh, what kind of obstacles would they come up with? with what are those idioms? How would those idioms re retranslate back into the language or how it are? Well, you know, that's a really good question. And I, I, I don't know how to answer that because I, I'm not a translator. Um, you know, I speak a little bit of Russian, but I'm, I, I, I'm not fluent. Um, um, I've done a little bit of translating, but it's work, right? Um, um, but I can say this, and maybe this is why my mom said that uh, you know the book has the Russian flavor to it. I, I worked really hard when I wrote this to think ahead of time, you know, what some of the words and phrases would be in Russian. And I worked with my wife to to find English equivalents to things that would sound authentic. You know, the, the book has to make sense to English readers, but I wanted it to feel authentic to the original language that these characters are speaking in. So um, I guess I'm just hoping that if it should ever get translated backwards, um, that I did a good enough job that, that maybe it won't be so hard for them to see, you know, what the flavor of the words was that I was using and, and where I was going with that. Um, although translation is notoriously tricky, right? It's notoriously tricky and, you know, the Russian language is so different from the English language and, and from the Kazakh language, uh, which is a Turkic language. So, um, you know, you're going to you're going to stumble over some things. But. Uh, a good translator knows how to work around it. That's great. Yeah. Courtney is there. That must be the it's the end of our time. Yes, we are winding down, but I just wanted to come back a little early to um, talk more about Jeff being in store tomorrow. So we are very excited to have Jeff coming into the store to sign. He's going to be in from 2 to 5 p.m. tomorrow. Um, so feel free to stop by, say hello. Um, and then also, if you, you know, don't feel comfortable coming to the store or you can't make it, uh, you can buy Jeff's book online at our at our store at grassrootsbookstore.com, uh, and you can put into the instructions field uh, that you want a personalized note. So you can put in what you want, and you know we can. The great thing about Jeff being in town is he can you know stop down in town and he can sign those copies before we get them out to you. Um, so feel free to do that. That's a really fun uh, holiday gift. It's a very fun personal gift, um, and then you have a specialized copy from Jeff. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Hey, and I want to throw out there that uh, at, after five o'clock when it's done, uh, I'll be heading down to block 15, not the one downtown, but the one down on Highway 99 at the edge of town. And anyone who wants to join me for a drink of choice, please feel free to and we can chat life, literature, Central Asia, America, whatever. So, all right, I think with that, we will wrap up, I guess. I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and especially, of course, Jeff and Charles for joining Grassroots for this exciting virtual event. Um, we're so happy to, you know, support you guys and have you on here. I only wish it could be in person. Yeah, soon enough. Yeah. Soon enough. Thank you, Courtney. Thanks, yep. Grassroots. Yes, thank you, Courtney. Grassroots, Charles, thank you. Jeff, well done. Thanks for those stories. All right. Hey, appreciate the support, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Have a good night. Take it easy. <laughs>